Welcome to this event. We have a few people coming in and we're going to get started a little late. Apologies for that. I'm Angela Brittlinger, Director of the Center for Slavic East European and, wait for it, Eurasian Studies. We are officially now also, it's in our name, we're covering Eurasia. Uh, but today we're talking with Simon Ostrowski and I'm going to let our third year dual MA student, Brandon Harvey, um, who is studying Poland and Russia, and uh, Polish and Russian and getting his master's in public affairs from the John Glenn School, uh, introduce our guest. All right, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Simon Ostrowski. He's a Emmy winning uh, PBS News Honor Special Correspondent who has covered conflict and upheaval throughout countries of the former Soviet Union and beyond in the last two decades. During his coverage of the war in Ukraine for Vice Media, he established the presence of Russian troops by verifying their social media posts and their locations in the field. Uh, the investigation was awarded the prestigious Alfred DuPont uh, Columbia University Award for its innovative reporting. More recently, he has worked closely with the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting to bring undercover stories like the popular uprising in Belarus and the war in uh, Nargono uh, Karabakh uh, to news hours national audience. Um, and so here is Simon Ostrowski. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's really a pre pleasure to be here um, with you guys today. I have a special place in my heart for Russian area studies students because I grew up in a family of uh, Slavic language teachers. Both my mom and my stepdad taught at the University of Michigan. So I'm sorry to say go blue to all of you Buckeyes out there. <laughs> But um, uh, it's definitely a world that uh, I've been steeped in pretty much uh, my entire life. Uh, and I've seen all of the uh, Russian language students of uh, my mother come through our front door with their complaints about the declensions and the cases and all of the difficulties. So hearing that Brandon is studying both Polish and Russian at the same time kind of blows my mind given that the languages are pretty similar, it must get so confusing sometimes. I don't know how you manage it. Um, a little bit of background about myself. My family came to the United States when I was just a baby, one and a half years old. And we were in New York at first, but we settled in Michigan eventually. And uh, when I was 17 years old, just a couple of days after the financial crisis, uh, You just got muted, Simon. Unmute. Somebody muted me. That's okay. I'm back. Just a couple of days after the financial crisis, uh, my family moved back to Russia in 1998 when I was 17 years old, and that's where I got my start in journalism. Um, first working at a newspaper called the St. Petersburg Times, and then a newspaper in Moscow owned by the same company called the Moscow Times, which is where I really cut my teeth in journalism. Uh, because it's where, first of all, it was a newspaper that came out five days a week, so it had daily deadlines. And second of all, uh, they were the first organization to send me to places like the North Caucasus to cover events in Chechnya. So I caught part of the Second Chechen War. And um, for those of you who remember in 2004, the Beslan School hostage taking, which was um, the most terrible thing that I had seen in my life up until that point when a school with uh, around a thousand people inside of it was uh, taken hostage in its entirety um, by a group of militants who were mostly from Chechnya, but also from a couple of the other um, mostly Muslim republics of the North Caucasus. And it ended in a bloodbath because um, the explosive devices that they had put throughout the school were um, detonated um, killing many of the people uh, at the same time and then a gun battle erupted. And you know, this was a, a really powerful uh, lesson on, for me, uh, on what Russia was willing to do to use brute force in order to achieve its goals. Because the, the story that came out in the report afterwards uh, was that the terrorists had detonated the bomb themselves. Uh, but you know what we assumed had happened at the time because we had heard gunfire was that somebody from outside decided to storm the school. And this was uh, after a couple of other incidents that had happened in Moscow that I had covered that sort of ended up in similarly in, in similar bloodbaths with the 
um, Nordost uh, theater siege where hundreds of people were taken hostage in a theater in Moscow and the Russians decided that the best way to free them would be to put everybody to sleep with poison gas, which killed many of the hostages themselves. Um, but I wasn't up close for that one. And this one I saw pretty viscerally and it, it didn't uh, deter me from the job. Uh, I was hired by my first international news organization thereafter, Agence France Press. They made me their correspondent for the South Caucasus region. Uh, so I ended up uh, covering the other side of the mountain range for three years, um, based out of Baku and Azerbaijan. Um, but they would send me to Armenia and to Georgia and to all of the frozen conflicts uh, in the region, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, you name it. And uh, that was a really interesting time to, to be in that part of the world as well, when it felt like the great powers were playing the great game um, all over again, uh, vying for influence in oil-rich Azerbaijan um, and uh, and Russians vying for influence in Georgia next door, which they then subsequently invaded a couple of years after I left. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Nagorno-Karabakh, which I visited on several occasions when it was peaceful, um, but revisited much more recently in uh, November and October uh, when the second Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, broke out just last year, at the end of last year. So, um, my career has taken me through all parts of the former Soviet Union, although I've never actually been to Moldova or Tajikistan, um, but I've pretty much been everywhere else. And uh, it's a region that I love going back to, that I feel very close to, that I found it pretty hard to cover in the circumstances of global pandemic. The reason I was able to get into Belarus is because Lukashenko says that the coronavirus pandemic is fake, so they have no travel restrictions whatsoever, um, which ironically made it easier for journalists to get into the country at the worst possible time for his regime for that to happen. Um, and uh, with Azerbaijan, it was also actually extraordinarily difficult to get into because they were a little bit more thoughtful about their border controls when it came to journalists. Um, and there was also a very uh, restri restrictive coronavirus regime um, for having visited. But luckily I was able to get into Nagorno-Karabakh, which is an area of Azerbaijan uh, that's internationally recognized as part of the territory of Azerbaijan, but until a few months ago was mostly controlled by ethnic Armenians. I was able to get into it from the Armenian side initially, um, where because the country was in chaos as a result of the war, um, there weren't that many restrictions. And in fact, the Armenian authorities were pretty um, excited about the prospect of uh, journalists coming in to uh, report on the uh, Azerbaijani offensive uh, against the ethnic Armenian ar areas of Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. So um, even though I've spent a lot of time indoors in between these reporting trips, I've uh, had the ability to do some coverage uh, outside of the country. International travel has been pretty surreal, um, but it's, it feels nice to be able to get out once in a while and to have an, a good, ex good enough excuse to do so. Obviously, I haven't been taking any vacations, um, but the public interest uh, value of being able to cover these under covered events, I think is high enough to justify that travel. And I'm very fortunate to be working for an outlet like PBS NewsHour, um, which has a mandate to cover stories in the public interest, unlike channels like CNN or Fox or MSNBC, which are trying to give you the stories that are gonna have the best ratings um, because that's how you make the most money possible, which is of course a simplification of the situation. But you know, that's definitely one of the main reasons that they cover the stories that they choose to cover. And uh, occasionally, of course, they do really important stories that are undercovered as well. At, New at NewsHour and on PBS more generally, you know, we see it as our mission to go to places that others won't go um, because it's not gonna get the viewership and it's not gonna get the ratings. Um, but we are funded through public donations from lots of different foundations. 
uh, and we're funded by the viewers themselves. And therefore there's not like this sort of direct wire that connects the popularity of a particular product to the viewership, um, you know, much in the way that, you know, social media functions. And that allows us to do the kind of stories that we do uh, in uh, places that are remote and hard to pronounce, um, like uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. I actually uh, really love the words Nagorno-Karabakh because they really describe uh, in and of themselves the conundrum that that region has found itself in, in so, for so many decades and so many generations. It's uh, two words that are composed of uh, three roots from three different languages. Nagorno is obviously Russian, it means mountainous. Karabakh is both Turkish and Persian in origin. Kara means black and Bakh means garden. So the translation of the, of the name means uh, the um, mountainous black garden. Um, but it tells you exactly who the powers are that have been uh, vying for control of that region over the centuries. And uh, it's been part of Persia, it's been part of Russia for sure, um, and Turkish armies have definitely slept, swept through there as well. Azerbaijanis themselves speak a Turkic language too. So that could be the origin of the Turkic uh, part of the name. Anyhow, it's a, it's a really interesting place. And if, um, because it's so undercovered, I feel like a lot of people don't understand the implications of uh, what has happened there. Um, especially because it was a frozen conflict for so long where people thought that uh, the status quo, which was one in which the Armenians control uh, all of the territory in question was one that was never going to change. Um, the status quo has changed. Armenians not only lost 30% of the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh itself, but here's something that a lot of people don't know about the conflict. For a long time, uh, Armenia controlled seven Azerbaijani regions that surround Nagorno-Karabakh, um, and they used it primarily as a buffer zone to separate themselves from the Azerbaijani military. Uh, and that meant that the uh, ethnic Azerbaijani towns that were within that buffer zone uh, were depopulated during the first war. And that Armenians uh, ended up in control of a lot of territory that they weren't actually using. And this was a very painful um, reality uh, that, the, that stoked uh, Azerbaijani discontent for decades. Even by the time that I had got there in 2004 and I was living in Baku, there were something like 750,000 refugees living in refugee towns, camps, and villages uh, set up for them in other parts of Azerbaijan still controlled by the central government. And it was also a major propaganda tool of the regime. There was always a convenient enemy, the Armenians, to blame Azerbaijan's problem on and to also rationalize the dictatorship that exists there. Um, the uh, issue with the seven surrounding regions was one that was so intractable because in Armenia there was this belief that Azerbaijan would never be able to break through the defenses that they created there. Um, that they seemingly weren't willing to consider a negotiated solution. Um, there was something called the Madrid principles that had been put out where the idea was the Armenians would get to keep two of the regions um, that would connect Nagorno-Karabakh to mainland Armenia so they could have a corridor to get between the two. And then the other remaining five regions around it would go to Azerbaijan. And it's, Allegedly, they got pretty close to signing papers on this, but every time that they got close to a negotiated resolution, Armenian public opinion would make it impossible for Armenian leaders to actually sign up for it because um, it threatened their electoral results. People would look at it and say, we fought and died for these territories. Why should we give them back to Azerbaijan, to our enemy, when they won't be able to uh, return it through their own means anyway? Meanwhile, uh, Azerbaijan was using its um, oil resources uh, in the Caspian Sea uh, to purchase all kinds of sophisticated weaponry, uh, including drones, which turned out to be critical and really shifted the balance of power 
uh, in the Caucasus and turn the tide of this war. Um, I think we're all used to the idea that drones are a weapon of war, but you know, just around 30 years ago when the first Nagorno-Karabakh conflict happened, uh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan was little different, used technology that wasn't that different from um, what was, how, how the war was fought during World War II. Um, and this time around, not only did they have drones, but they had swarms of uh, miniature drones, which are called loitering munitions, um, which will hang around in the sky uh, looking for a target. And when they see one, they'll dive bomb on the target and hit it like a kamikaze. And, you know, that's even a shift to how war has been waged with drones by um, America, which sort of relies on these really large ones, which are usually used for their range. They can carry missiles. Sometimes they're just used for targeting. They identify the target, a missile launches either from the ground or from the drone itself. This, these, these drones were much smaller, harder to detect, harder to shoot down, and the drones themselves were the missiles, and they terrified uh, anybody who was on the ground. And I can attest to that myself because I experienced you know, that terror when I was in um, Stepanakert in October, and you would hear this eerie buzz of the drone circling overhead, sounding like kind of like a lawnmower in the sky. Um, and as soon as you heard that sound, you stopped whatever you were doing. In my case, shooting an interview. Um, but you know, if you're a soldier, it's aiming your weapon or you know trying to counter the enemy, and and you'd hide yourself away. And this psychological effect, even if you weren't the target of the drone, it was so profound um, that it, it really, I think, played a massive role uh, in, in the war. And these drones were provided uh, to uh, Azerbaijan by um, countries like Turkey, a major ally, but also, uh, surprisingly to many, uh, Israel um, sell, sold a lot of, uh, of these drones to Azerbaijan. And the reason for that is that the European Union um, and the United States have a, something like an embargo uh, on the warring uh, parties um, in the Karabakh conflict. And so we're not offering that technology to them. Um, Turkey and Israel saw a market opportunity there. Um, there's gonna be, I, as I understand the period for asking questions uh, at the end of this, but uh, I can move on to Belarus in the meantime, and which was the previous story that I did, and I can give you a little uh, rundown uh, of what I saw there. Um, if you haven't been following because a lot of uh, water's gone under the bridge since the uprising against Lukashenko started in August, um, there was a really unprecedented popular movement uh, in Belarus, which I would say nearly topper, toppled Alexander Lukashenko, the former uh, communal farm boss who's been running that country for more than 26 years now. Um, and it was surprising, uh, not just because of how long he's been in power, but because of the attitude uh, that most people assumed Belarusians have. Um, which was one of, uh, mm, I would say, passivity, uh, especially in terms of politics. And it was a very similar situation uh, in Belarus in some respects uh, that played out compared to what happened in Ukraine, which I was describing uh, earlier to the student group that I spoke to, um, where you had protesters come out uh, into some of the central squares of the city and the police reacted in such a brutal and visible and visual way that people saw on the internet and on television that it actually increased the protest movement because it made people angry. And you know, this is the mistake that authoritarian leaders often make is by uh, using overbearing force uh, on their public when if they had just stepped back um, then probably things would have resolved themselves and things would have dissipated. But instead, they get into a situation where the protest movement snowballs and then they have to use increased amounts of violence and force in order to try to control the movement. And that's exactly what happened in Belarus, but I think Belarus 
had the benefit of um, the experience of Ukraine and its leader realized that he could end up like, uh, like uh, Yanukovych, the former president of Ukraine in exile in Russia, or uh, he could just double down on the crackdown and try to hold on to power for as long as possible. Um, unfortunately uh, for, well, first of all, I should probably say that uh, what sparked this entire movement was uh, an election um, in August, which was believed by many people in Belarus to be entirely unfair. And I don't know what changed exactly this time around compared to previous elections that have happened in Belarus, which were equally unfair, but didn't lead to widespread massive protest movements. Um, but this one did, and it might have had something to do with the people who were in the, on, the, on the ballot. So Svetlana Tsikhanouska was the first major female political candidate uh, in Belarus. That, that was certainly a departure from the past. Um, she was also you know, described as this regular um, housewife in the Belarusian uh, Russian media, um, which I think uh, she was obviously more than that because she was also an English teacher. Um, uh, in previous years, but I think it spoke to a lot of people in Belarus uh, in the sense that it said, this is a regular person like us who isn't part of the system. And it also backfired for the regime because, um, because they had allowed her onto the ballot because you have to understand that in Belarus, any, whoever gets onto the ballot, that's a decision made by the Central uh, Electoral Commission, uh, which is controlled by the presidency. And uh, so it was obviously, it was some kind of a calculated decision to put her on the ballot uh, or to allow her to put herself on the ballot. Um, because I think they assumed that they underestimated, essentially, they thought that a woman wouldn't be able to galvanize the kind of support um, that would be necessary to, you know, win an election, but let alone um, engender uh, some kind of a massive protest movement. And they were dead wrong. Um, but what they weren't dead wrong about was that doubling down on the crackdown um, could have an effect and sort of just make the protest movement lead nowhere. And people continue to protest in Belarus even today, uh, and they continue to be arrested in large numbers. And one of the more disturbing things that has been going on over the last couple of weeks, which I'm particularly concerned about, um, is the fact that uh, many journalists uh, have been given real sentences um, just for doing their job and covering um, events in Belarus. And these are local uh, Belarusian journalists who really need our support um, because they're being given sentences like two, two and a half years. In fact, one of the journalists, she um, works for an outlet called Tut BY, um, which, um, she reported on a, a case of one of the protesters being killed. The authorities said that he had died of a heart condition or something along those lines, but she found the doctor who did the autopsy, who went on the record um, to say that it was actually police action, which led to his death. And not only did they put her in jail, but they put him in jail as well. And they charged both of them with releasing the private information of a patient, which is uh, illegal uh, under Belarusian law. Um, and so there's another group of uh, people from the journalist sphere. It's, it's called the, Belar the Press, Cl Press Club Belarus, um, which often invites journalists. I've been invited uh, in the past there uh, to speak on their platform. Um, and to talk about their work. And the purpose of it is to connect uh, journalists from the outside world to journalists inside Belarus so we can you know, share experiences um, and learn from each other. And uh, they were helping a lot of the foreign journalists who came into the country with advice, information, just background, whatever they could, because that's their purpose. Um, and so the Belarusian authorities decided to slap a tax evasion charge on um, four of the top members of the organization, including its director. And they're in jail now. They've been in jail since November or December, and they're still awaiting trial. So their fate is really up in the air at the moment. And 
members, uh, other lower down members of the Belarus, uh, the press club Belarus continue to function, they continue to operate, um, but they've all had to flee to neighboring countries like uh, Ukraine and Poland. Um, so, you know, I, I really wish that uh, there was more of a focus uh, on their plight and on the situation in Belarus in general, um, which continues. And I'm glad that we were able to get uh, funding from the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting, which funds a lot of my work and makes it possible for me to travel to some of these undercovered places um, in collaboration with News Hour, so we could do the stories that we did do uh, back in September uh, of last year. Um, and uh, I, I really think that it's time to go back, but I think it's gonna be a lot diff more difficult to get into the country because I think that uh, the Belarusian authorities have learned from the experience back in October um, that lots of journalists were slipping in undetected and bringing reports out from there. And uh, you know, even while I was there, they had essentially declared open season on all sorts of journalists, not the local ones. And we really felt hunted because um, journalists were being grabbed out of their hotel rooms uh, and were being deported, um, you know, if they were from foreign countries. If they were from neighboring Russia, then they were put on buses and driven across the border and dumped unceremoniously over there. Um, but you know, we really felt that the that the authorities were after us, and I remember leaving and just breathing this sigh of relief after having been there for two weeks, with this kind of oh constant fear and looking over your shoulder and wondering whether the person renting you the apartment um, is informing to the authorities and trying to make arrangements where we'd live in apartments without registering our passports at the address. I actually like would register my passport in one hotel, but live in an apartment somewhere else so that it wouldn't be as easy to find me. And, doing things like that, it, it gets really hard to plan your stories, plan your interviews, plan where you're gonna be spending the night when you have to jump through all kinds of hoops just to stay safe. Um, so that was my experience in Belarus. And I think uh, Ukraine is probably a longer conversation that we can have. Uh, Eileen, is there anything, or Angela, sorry, is there anything that you wanted to uh, add at this point that maybe I haven't spoken about that you would like to hear? more about well I you know so this is so useful and so interesting to think about and comparing the places where you have been um you know listening to you talk about your hotel fears in Belarus I can compare to one of our uh faculty members who was uh doing his work and and was at the Maidan plaza in a hotel watching on the 10th story and not at all afraid for his life uh, in Ukraine. So it just makes a, it's a really interesting moment when Belarus has come to this, to the, to the world stage. Nobody has been paying attention to Belarus for many years. Uh, and, and now all of a sudden it's, it's fantastic. That this reporting is happening and it's terrifying what's going on. I, because we have a kind of a short time frame, I was thinking maybe we would open it up to Q&A if you're okay with that. Um, Absolutely, yeah. We have, I think, because this is a webinar, I think the best thing is, is for our, we have about 30 people here. If they could uh, write something in the Q&A, uh, we'll be able to read it out and Simon can answer it. Um, while we're waiting, I was gonna comment uh, about Crimea. You were talking with our students about your experience in reporting in Crimea. Um, my problem when I was in, um, in Russia after Crimea uh, was to the ways in which our Russian friends split you know, we as Americans believe strongly that international borders have meaning. And, um, and many of my Russian said, friends would say, of course I'm a Krim Nazist. So the, the term, uh, when Joe was asking about the use of, of Nazi terminology, uh, fascist terminology, of course this word Krim Nash, Crimea is ours, emerged. And then the term Krim Nazist, he's somebody who believes that Crimea is ours, which rhymes with fascist. Uh, and my Russian friends would say, of course, Crimea is ours, many of my Russian friends. And there was a big, a big sort of conflict at even academic, you know, literary uh, conferences as to who do you talk to now? How do you talk about things, given what you feel has been happening in Crimea? It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think it's a very difficult uh, situation um, because while many uh, Russians, and you can argue about whether this is right or wrong, feel that Russia has a historic um, a historic right to include that territory as part of its country. 
um, far fewer people ask themselves about the consequences of actually going forward and acting on those perceived historic rights. And I think the biggest con uh, consequence is, of course, uh, you losing the Ukrainian people as a friendly neighbor. And you know what's more important to you, being able to control a piece of territory or having a country of 40 million people on your border that hates you? Um, and uh, you know, I think that those, the kind of actions that uh, were taken without thought for for the future generations and for the sort of historical concept context of what that would lead to in the end, um, make it all very misguided. And I sort of came around to this type of thinking during one of my interviews uh, in Crimea uh, during what turned out to be the annexation, um, where I was standing outside of the uh, parliament of Crimea where some of, go ahead. You no. were gonna say something? No, no, where, no. Where, um, where the, many of the votes had uh, taken place by the uh, Russia aligned members uh, to move closer towards Russia. And there was a man, just a local resident, and I asked him, uh, where are you from? He said, I'm from here. And I said, well, um, what's your ethnicity? He said, I'm Russian. And I said, well, what do you think about what's going on in there today? And he says, I think it's very sad. I think it's very sad because we have lost the Ukrainian people as our friends forever. And that is a very sad thing, actually. And I, I think, you know, as painful as not having control of Crimea might have been for a lot of Russians, that simple fact should be a lot more painful. Because you can't expect to act on your own perceived historical rights without um, how that's going to uh, affect the other side of the equation. And I think it was unreasonable to expect that Ukrainians saw things the same way. Well, and it's interesting too, I wanna to go to the question in the Q&A, but it's interesting to think too about, it's not just two sides in Crimea. Last time I was there, there was a lot of uh, Crimean Tatar nationalist movement happening and people coming back and reclaiming territories. And I don't know what has happened now to those Crimean Tatar mi minorities who are returning. Um, now that it's Russia again, I don't know how things are going to be. I think it's become very difficult for them and uh, uh, a terrifying place to live all over again. Um, yeah. And a lot of uh, Crimean Tatars have been disappeared. A lot of them have been imprisoned on spurious charges. Um, their quasi-legislative body, the Medjlis, um, which existed during uh, Ukraine's control of the peninsula, and had a sort of consultative uh, authority uh, uh, has been completely disbanded and its leaders chased out. Um, so they have no political representation anymore, um, no uh, say in their own fate and their own affairs. Um, and essentially they have to uh, walk the line that the Kremlin sets uh, or else. That's the situation for the Crimean Tatars and many of them have left and uh, emigrated out of the country altogether or to other parts of Ukraine. There's a big community in Kiev now, and especially in Lviv in Western Ukraine, um, where a lot of the uh, ethnic Tatars from Crimea uh, have ended up. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Okay, well, I'm going to start and then maybe Brandon will take over. The first question is from Marianne Marian Baidazar, who talks about the three competing forces involved in the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, how have these events contributed to the growing ethnic tensions in the region? She wants to ask. Um, I think they have contributed in a sort of uh, unpredictable, maybe counterintuitive way in a sense. Um, Remember when I was talking about Karabakh, we talked about these seven surrounding regions around Nagorno-Karabakh, which were originally primarily populated by Azerbaijanis before the first war. Um, and those people were chased out and that caused a massive grievance uh, among Azerbaijanis, which they nurtured for years and years and years uh, until they counterattacked and won all of that territory back, but also 30, roughly a third of uh, the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh itself, which had been populated uh, almost exclusively by Armenians. And in the Soviet 
period primarily by Armenians. Um, so what we have is an equal, maybe not an equal, but an opposite situation um, to what we had for the interwar period between the first and the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, where in the first instance, you had swathes of territory that had been Azerbaijani ethnically cleansed. Now you have swathes of territory within Nagorno-Karabakh that have been ethnically cleansed by Armenians, uh, of Armenians. And so what this is gonna lead to is Armenians nurturing for the foreseeable future, the same kind of grievance that the Azerbaijanis had nurtured against the Armenians. And which is why in you know, talks that I've given on this subject, I've often talked about the need for um, reconciliation and for Azerbaijan to take steps to mitigate this problem and to allow the Armenians to come back to their homes in the areas that they lived in of Nagorno-Karabakh before the second war. And it seems counterintuitive to Azerbaijanis because they look at it as getting their comeuppance. Um, and that finally, you know, justice has been served on some level, but that's a very short-sighted view um, because Armenians certainly don't see it that way. And by clearing those areas of their ethnic Armenian population, um, they are just setting, planting the seeds for a future uh, conflict to erupt at some place down the line. And I think the only way to resolve that uh, would be for Azerbaijan to take concrete steps to make it seem safe for, Azerbaij for Armenians to go back to those areas. And that's much more easily said than done because for years, the propaganda coming out of Baku has uh, talked about, has dehumanized Armenians and talked about them as, um, you know, uh, fascist uh, occupiers who are not worthy of life. And so Armenians understand that going back to an area controlled by Azerbaijan, even if that offer is on the table, which at this point, they, well, they say it's on the table, but there's no functional way of implementing it at the moment. But e even with the offer on the table, I think very few Armenians would take it up um, without Azerbaijan doing a lot of work uh, to make it seem safe for Armenians to do that really hope they do that work. And uh, because, you know, for me as a humanist and as a journalist, um, it's not so important uh, what the name of the country is, as long as people's human rights uh, are being uh, respected there. And, you know, I would say that for uh, every country that has a territorial conflict, whether it's Israel, Palestine, or Cyprus, or Nagorno-Karabakh, or you name it, you know, if, if, an, if a, somebody comes to power there and they can uh, guarantee the personal rights of every ethnic group that lives under it, I'm okay with that. And I think that that's the uh, attitude that Azerbaijan should take up now if it wants to have legitimacy. Because Azerbaijan thinks that the fact that Nagorno-Karabakh is on the map within its internationally recognized borders um, gives it all the legitimacy it needs. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, you earn uh, legitimacy through building trust um, with all of the people seated at the table. All right, thanks for that response. Um, our next question is from Phil. He wants to know if you have any recommendations for students who have a, a broad Russian area uh, expertise or skills and how they could transfer that, those, you know, those skills and expertises into the journalism field. Sure. So I think if your specific interest is Russia related or Russia area related, Eurasian, Eastern European, then it's very important for you to be in those places when you're starting out as a journalist, because I don't think anybody's going to be interested in your thoughts um, on Russia, et cetera, from your seat here in the United States. So you've got to find a way to get out there and to sort of be the eyes and the ears for, uh, for your audience. That's definitely the first step that you need to take, but that also means, of course, that you've got to get your language skills up to scratch because if you're starting out, then you're competing against a bunch of people who have been in the field for a lot longer. Um, and so, you know, you've got to be able to stand out somehow. And one way that you could stand out is by becoming an expert in a niche subject, uh, 
that this is by learning an incredibly difficult language like Russian um, as it is and by uh, making yourself uh, available in the right place uh, at the right time, biding your time and waiting for that moment to happen. And that's not the only way to get into journalism, but I think it's the best way to get into journalism focused on the region. Um, you know, if you're interested in journalism more broadly, there's obviously lots of different routes that you could go. Um, you know, you could start out here in the United States and work your way up through from an internship, say, to a staff position. Um, but when you're, if you're starting from the bottom of a big organization and moving your way up the ladder, uh, then there's any number of routes that that career could send you down. And there's no way that you can guarantee that you're going to be able to use the skills that you've spent so much time investing in um, at a Slavic program uh, in university. So um, that's why I think, you know, you can sort of self-select by just uh, dropping yourself into the area that you're interested in and uh, starting, uh, starting there. I mean, that's how I did it, not because somebody advised it to me because I just happened to be in Russia and I wanted to be a journalist and that sort of uh, predetermined uh, my course to some extent. Although for years I've been trying to break out of it and to diversify my uh, subject area. And I could tell you a lot more about that, but I know that those aren't the stories that you're interested in hearing about today. Okay, well, maybe the next question might get you down that path. Um, it says, what is the most dangerous assignment you have had? Maybe uh, the one that made you question your profession slash calling? Um, it's hard to say what your most dangerous assignment is because you never know how close to things going totally wrong um, you are, you know, if a uh, shell lands uh, 100 yards away from you and you come away unscratched, um, you were maybe within an inch of your life, but you didn't know it. Um, so you, you end up kind of tending to focus on the times where things went seriously wrong. And uh, for me, uh, that was in uh, Ukraine, which was probably the longest conflict that I've ever covered. So I guess it's not surprising that my worst experience happened there. Um, but uh, in 2014, as I was covering the eruption of hostilities in Eastern Ukraine, some of the pro-Russia separatists uh, kidnapped me and held me for three days in a basement with a bunch of other um, hostages that they had taken. And uh, I genuinely didn't know whether I was going to come out of that uh, scenario alive because I was being held in the separatist headquarters in a town called Slavyansk, um, which was formerly the security service of Ukraine building that they had taken over, which was formerly the security service of the Soviet Union, the KGB regional office. Um, and so they had a prison downstairs, um, which me and the others were kept in. And the day before I had, I had been there uh, interviewing and they displayed a body in front of the building. So I knew that they were prepared to kill and I was in their hands. And so of course the uncertainty of not knowing whether you would get through something was the worst part of it, but you know, the beatings didn't help as well. Right. I was uh, interested in the drones that you were talking about. So when they, they had some type of explosive devices attached to them or how would they, uh, okay. They, I mean, there, there were a lot of different kinds of drones that were being used uh, during the Karabakh war. So the one that was kind of in the headlines the most was this Bayraktar drone, which is manufactured in Turkey. And this isn't a loitering munition per se, it's more of your classic drone, but it's, you know, it's not that large. And you can actually put rockets under its wings and it finds a target and then it fires the rocket at the target. So that's your kind of classic drone scenario. Um, but uh, they were also using these uh, Israeli drones, the name of which escapes me at the moment, um, where the munition itself was packed into the body of the drone. And the drones were much smaller even than the Bayraktar, Turkish drone. Um, and so you, you could launch these. And the reason they were so 
dangerous is because you could barely perceive them. Um, and uh, they were uh, nearly impossible to shoot down with anti-aircraft uh, missiles. Um, and even if they were easy to shoot down with anti-aircraft missiles, they were so much cheaper than even one missile um, that the Azerbaijanis could, they didn't spare them. They used uh, just hundreds of them, maybe thousands. And the Armenian forces and had uh, anti-aircraft systems that were provided to them by Russia, which were outdated, which were built in the Soviet period in order to take down big jet engines. Um, and so they were pretty much useless uh, against these things. And you know, every time you fired one, it cost you tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, whereas with the drones, they could just launch as many of them as they wanted. Uh, and they were deadly. And even if the charge inside of them wasn't that large, it could kill a, a group of soldiers who were pretty close to each other. Do we have any more questions among the audience? Um, this is such a treat to have Simon here with us today. Maybe somebody's typing right now. Brandon, you have another question? Um, yeah. It was it's really just interesting hearing about everything that you've continued to cover. And like I said, I had first started um, watching everything that you were doing in 2014 when I first went to Russia. And so that gave me like, I guess the interest of, or continue my interest in going to Russia. And also I was researching it to get like a feel of what is going on. How are they really acting over here, you know? And earlier in the, Q or in the discussion uh, room we had, you were talking about how in Ukraine there was a, it's an undescribable feeling of when you see one flag go down in the country and another one go up. And it's like, you can't describe it. And I was just so happy I was able to see it, you know, uh, like living through your, you know, news reports. And it's, it's like, um, I, you would see the people saying, yeah, we want Russia here. Then you say, you see the people that are saying, no, we don't want Russia here. And it's like, okay, I would look at people and I would say, oh, this is like a group of older men and like, you know, older, this is like an old woman. Like, obviously they must want Russia here or something like that. But then at the same time, it's like, you don't know how to, um, I understand what they're thinking in the situation. Are they, are these actual citizens or are these like, you know, people, Russia can send older people to this area to spread propaganda as well. So like, you know, when you come across this type of people, what, how do you see them? Do you see them as, okay, these are citizens who have been, you know, um, prop like they've been listening to propaganda and they've been convinced or are you thinking these are possible, you know, people sent from Russia as well? Yeah, it's hard to know in every instance unless you investigate the person you're speaking with specifically. And I've, I've done an uh, investigation like that as it regarded uh, a Russian serviceman because I thought it was important to show that one of the soldiers um, that had been uh, sent to Ukraine wasn't, you know, just a volunteer as Putin had been claiming at the time, uh, who had taken vacation from the army and come across the border. Um, so, you know, that investigation actually took me around three or four months to do, and I, I tracked his uh, social media posts uh, in the field, as in in the real world. So this soldier was putting photographs uh, online on a Facebook clone they have in Russia called VK.com. And uh, my job was to download these photographs, inspect them, try to figure out where they had been taken and then verify that they had actually been taken in Ukraine. And the way I did that was once I had a pretty strong idea of where the photograph had been taken, I would actually go to that place, find the exact camera angle and uh, replicate the photograph using myself as a model. So I would stand in the position that the soldier had been standing in at the very exact same place um, and uh, reenact the photograph um, primarily as a way of uh, illustrating to my viewer that I had done the legwork and that this wasn't just you know, something that I was guessing, but I actually knew to be sure 100%, but I also needed to be sure 100% that he was an active service military uh, member. And so I went to Russia to track him down um, thousands of miles from the Ukrainian border where he originated from in a region called Buryatia. 
uh, and we had photographs there that we re reenacted and he had taken plenty of photographs at his, of himself at his military base, both before uh, he went to Ukraine and after he went to Ukraine wearing uniform. So there was no way that you could argue that this was a person who was a veteran and had decided to go of his own accord. He was in the Russian military before he went to Ukraine. Then we had pictures of him while he was in Ukraine wearing military garb without any identifying markings, but not a standard Russian uniform. And then we had photographs of him that he had taken himself um, in Russia wearing the standard Russian uniform again. And through you know, a meticulous process like that, you can answer the kind of question that you're asking about a person. But if you don't, then you're making assumptions. And I'm glad that uh, I had the opportunity to do that investigation because it makes it much easier for me as a journalist to talk about the subject. Um, because I know now, we'll, beyond the shadow of a doubt, a doubt, that Russia was officially involved with its own military in Ukraine. That makes it, uh, much easier to describe the situation and talk about who's responsible and what the ramifications are. All right, thanks for that. Um, I guess for the last question we can end on is what do you think has been the biggest failure in Western media's, uh, media's reporting on the Ukraine uh, or on Ukraine, if there has been any? Hmm. That's a tough one. I think, you know, the narrative around Ukraine has really shifted during the Trump presidency uh, in an unfor unfortunate way where Ukraine was pulled into national American politics um, in, in a way that it hadn't been before. You know, in, in, in previous uh, years, at least as regards Ukraine, you know, other countries to a lesser extent, but politics ended at the border. Uh, the, at the United States border. And Ukraine was seen as a bipartisan uh, uh, or an issue that both parties uh, pretty much agreed on. Um, and in 20, I guess, 19, um, when that famous phone call happened that Trump was uh, eventually impeached over, um, Ukraine started stopped being seen for uh, its own problems and was seen as an American political problem. And we stopped talking about it in the context of um, what it meant for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And we started talking about in the context of what it meant for Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Hunter Biden. And that obviously put the Ukrainian authorities in a very awkward position where they had to walk this tightrope of trying not to upset either party, which was impossible to do, and an incredibly hard tightrope to walk when you take into consideration the fact that they were still fighting an active war about uh, 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 against a superior, much larger foe in their east and relied on the United States for political backing, but as well as uh, supplies of uh, weapons um, and training. And so I think it was really cynical, of course, what. Trump did to um, put that in the balance and uh, hold it over Ukraine's head and say that he would rescind this assistance if the Ukrainians didn't play along with his political electoral game of making um, uh, Joe Biden look bad through via his son, um, who did genuinely have a questionable position in an energy company um, over there uh, in Ukraine. But, Again, I mean, I think the result overall was one that was uh, very detrimental to the to to Ukrainians and, and, and Ukraine at large. Um, so, you know, I wish as uh, media organizations we had the ability to cover both the political context, as it is important to our own domestic politics, but have as much wavelength to talk about what's really going on for Ukrainians too. And I kind of feel like a lot of the time it's one or the other and it can't be both. Um, and I wish that weren't true. All right, um, would you be willing to answer one more question? We have a late one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, um, and this isn't, I guess your specific area of focus, but if you could just generally answer it or the best of your ability is great. It says in the uh, earlier chat, we talked about the foreign policy in post-Soviet states but um, 
we just wanted to know more about the Russian foreign policy in the Middle East when it comes to Syria, for example? You know, I can't say I'm an expert um, because I have traveled to Syria and I think the last time I was there was in 2013, sort of in the early stages of the war, I went to the northern part um, that was controlled by Kurds. Uh, and Russia actually wasn't involved uh, in Syria at that time. I think they sent troops there in 2015, um, as far as I can remember. But I kind of sort of see the Syrian issue and the Ukrainian issue tied together in the sense that everything that Russia does internationally is part of its um, attempt to gain influence for the sake of influence itself. Um, you know, I think you can view Russian foreign policy through that uh, prism um, pretty much consistently. And uh, everything that they do is in order to try to get more power and influence. It's not actually specific goals that they're trying to achieve. It's generally, they're trying to do things that will increase their influence. So why did, if you wanna ask the question, why did, Syria, why did Russia involve itself in Syria? Well, they may give you a number of answers for that, but the primary answer is that gives Russians more influence and leverage in the Middle East. Um, and internationally when dealing with uh, the United States uh, or Europe on, on other issues that could be important to Russia. Um, because, you know, the, depending on the way the tide of fighting in Syria turns, um, you could have, you know, either a flood of refugees coming into Europe or you could uh, turn the tap off. And that's, that's leverage. And uh, that's what Putin's interested uh, in leverage. Um, and that's just one example of the kind of leverage that you can get um, by being uh, inside Syria. Um, I see a similar kind of uh, rationale to the international diplomacy that Russia is deploying right now with the Sputnik V vaccine. Um, while supplies of it run out in Russia itself, they are sending shipments of it to places like South America, uh, Africa, Asia. Um, and uh, making a whole song and dance on state TV in Russia about uh, how it's being welcomed when it gets there. And I'm sure it is being welcomed and it's great that these people are getting the vaccine, but the purpose of it from the Russian perspective is to, is to strengthen ties, strengthen influence in those countries, uh, move into other regional powers backyards and, um, and gain a foothold there, uh, so to speak, even if it's at the expense of uh, vaccination at home. That's how strong the imperative is in Russia for gaining influence and power um, across the globe. And so I think you can look at Syria through that context. All right, well, thanks a lot for everybody who attended. And we really wanna say thank you again, Simon, for being here and answering these questions giving these great responses. And um, yeah, we were really excited about this and I'm happy it came out to be a great event. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing to be here with you guys. I love speaking uh, with students and I'm really hoping that the person who asked the question about journalism uh, ends up following through on that path. And uh, because, you know, misery loves company. And, uh, <laughs> but feel free, any one of you to get in touch with me in the future, if you have any follow-up questions or if there's something that I could be helpful uh, to you on, my email is simon.ostrovsky at gmail.com. So it's pretty easy to remember, um, you know, shoot me an email and I would really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. Well, thank you again. We can't tell you how pleased we are with this event and how much we would love you to come and visit us in Columbus, Ohio, where we would buy you not just a cup of coffee, but, you know, perhaps lunch. That'd be great. So, thanks again. This pandemic is over. Thanks. Let's do it. Hey, and don't forget about the Let's bus drivers. We, we can show you uh, OSU, you know. Forget about Michigan. That's right. That's right. Done with. Forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.